Hello, everyone. Let me share this brief text from 1 John 4.16. So we have known and believed that this is the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. If I ask you to close your eyes and picture God, what do you see? How would you describe God? What is your image of God? In 1 John, there is this simple image that God is love and those who abide in love, who live in love, abide in God and God abides or lives in them. In the Christian New Testament, the word abide is meneo. It means to sojourn, to continue or to be held. So when I read this text, I hear two things. When we live in love, we are held in God and when we love God, God is held in us. I want to talk for a bit about this last piece, how God abides in us, how we are the holding place for God. The writer is saying that we are God's abode, God's apartment. We're God's condo, God's dorm room, God's house or God's SRO. We are God's love shack. Why does God choose to live in us, to be held by us? Just because. Not because we're beautiful or smart or rich or perfect or fabulous or because we've worked hard or prayed hard. Just because. We are God's tent, God's home. As the B-52s sing, we're God's love shack, baby. And, and here's what really excites me. This scripture from the Judeo-Christian tradition is not only the theology that indicates that God's inside of us. The yogis chant an ancient Sanskrit blessing, Om Naya Shivaya Why? It means, I bow to Shiva, the supreme reality, the inner self. It's the name given to consciousness that dwells in all of us. This mantra is free of all restrictions. It can be repeated by anyone, young or old, rich or poor, and no matter what state a person is in, they will be purified. The belief is that bowing to Shiva is bowing to God, the great almighty. The repetition of the name of God is equivalent to being merged in God's very being. Many Buddhists, Taoists, and Hindus greet each other with namaste, which literally means I bow to you. So the concept is that the divine spark in me recognizes the divine spark in you. I have a thesis that we human beings don't really fully know who we are. Most of us have a case of mistaken identity. If we really believe that God lives in us, how would our lives look? How could we be cruel to anybody, blow up anybody, fight with anybody, destroy the souls of anybody if we thought they housed God? How could we put poison in our own bodies, let somebody hurt us, not take care of our bodies if we believed God was inside? How could we even bear to hurt the feelings of the other if we thought that God would get God's feelings hurt at the same time? I say we don't believe it not nearly enough, not for long enough, for it to shape whom we are and how we live. And so we wander about lost and lonely, frightened and false, angry and agitated, liftless and lifeless, or let me tell you a secret, this is my disease. We run about with such speed and haste so as to avoid ever noticing that we're empty inside or afraid. We live life without balance. And most of our world religions understand this concept. The Taoists call it imbalance. Buddhism calls it ignorance. Islam blames our misery on rebellion against God. And the Judeo-Christian tradition calls our lack of understanding of our oneness with God, original sin. What would it mean for us to live as though God lives in us, as though the divine resides in us? I think we need an extreme house makeover to make more room inside for God to live in us. 
From a broom sweeping to a total gutting, we need to make room. We need to do some cleanup. There's just some junk in there that needs to go. I think this house makeover idea is about three things. Prepare, pray, and participate. First, we prepare by making room inside so we can see that God is indeed in there. I have a friend named Lincoln. We grew up in the same neighborhood in Chicago. Lincoln is one of those really scary, frighteningly smart people. When he was in college, he hit a rough spot, like, I don't know, an existential crisis at 18. He was miserable and went through a phase where he drank vodka for water. I remember he called me one day when I was in grad school and said, I'm either going to talk to you now or I'm driving into a tree. The vodka was an analgesic. His spirit was broken. His house had too much junk in it for him to look inside and recognize God living there. It took some time, but he went to counseling and found a great place to worship in community and threw away his fear, his sense that he was not worthy of being a love shack and saw in himself the goodness God sees. Second, we pray. Since God lives inside, we can't really redecorate without being in conversation. We can't draw up remodeling plans without some give and take. We can read our holy texts and get great suggestions, but in order to really know the holy, we need to pray. And prayer is a conversation, not a list of demands. God wants so much to be in communication with us. Sometimes our lives will heat up so that we will start talking with God. The woman who wrote the best-selling book, Eat, Love, Pray, is Elizabeth Gilbert. Liz's marriage was falling apart and she was devastated. She had never prayed, never had a conversation with God. Sitting on the bathroom floor, weeping, feeling really at the bottom, she spoke to God like the polite writer she is. She introduced herself to God and said, Hi, hi God, this is Liz. I've never done this before, but I, I have communicated my gratitude at least. Please. If you can just tell me what to do, tell me what to do. She says she heard a voice, not Charlton Heston and not Whoopi Goldberg, but she heard her own voice, her own best, purest, unwounded voice. And that voice was what she needed to hear. The voice said, go back to bed. It sounded right and real to her, her best inner divine spark, God in the flesh, talking to her in her own voice. And God just may do that, you know, so we actually recognize what God is saying. So we're not startled out of our clothes, so we can believe what we hear. If you were to take a moment now to be silent, to hear your own godly self, that part of you where God resides, what would you hear that voice saying? I hope you would hear it say, I love you so much. You don't have anything to do in order for me to love you. You are not the sum total of your mistakes, nor are you the sum total of your successes. You are just mine, and I love you. And finally, we participate. We do not serve a puppeteer. We are on this planet to do something, to be something. I think it's to partner with the holy, to become who God wants us to be. And so we move with God, we dance with God, we push and shove and tussle with God. God survives our anger and we survive our anger too. In the turning and the twisting, we become who God wants us to be. I'm 50 years old, and I'm not finished becoming, but I am on my way. I'm no longer afraid of what people think of me. I I'm just here. When I make mistakes, I don't collapse. I just say, oops. I get up, and I believe that I'm forgiven. All of my dreams have not come true. I grieve. I grieve a child I did not have. I think I would have been a great mom. And there are wonderful children in my life. And my husband and my family make me feel so happy. I feel, like, I feel like God and I have partnered pretty well, and I sense that I am participating in what God is doing 
in the world. How about you? God lives inside all of us, you little love shack. And we're not finished. Thank you.